Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rogers Hall. I'm a professor and chair in the Department of Teaching and Learning and really happy to see you tonight. We have visitors from the University of Melbourne in Australia to talk with us about designing spaces for learning. What's next? When we first hatched this idea, there was an image of a Sumerian classroom from very, very long ago. Uh, I think we're well past that now and hopefully the conversation today will be, will be uh, you know, more designerly and interesting. Um, this is part of an uh, effort that's been going on for about a year. It's a small-scale exploration between our faculty and faculty in the School of Architecture at Melbourne to really think about how their perspectives on design could inform the way we think about design studies, learning sciences issues, and the like. And we're partway along on that. And the purpose of this week is to explore some concepts together and hopefully find things we want to do together in the future over the next three to five years. So we welcome your participation in this. I know some of you from all over the city, really happy to see you here, and also people from across the university. Uh, Dean Cho Cravens, I thought, would say a little bit about their program, and then Kevin Leander, my colleague, is going to introduce the visitors. Hi, my name is Cho Cravens. I'm the Associate Dean for International Affairs for Peabody College. I'm just here to, um, to say how happy and how wonderful it is when a conversation probably at the uh, outside circle of a reception at Melbourne, um, at a visit that the provost made, um, that I uh, was also there in uh, May 2011. Um, that it would actually eventually arrive at this wonderful event where researchers and scholars and architects could come together uh, cross-cultural, cross-disciplinary, uh, cross-continent, cross a lot of bridges and things that we typically feel like would be kind of impossible to cross um, and then come together to have this dialogue and this conversation. So this is um, really an exciting event. I want to thank many people to start with. Would be Carolyn Miller uh, with the Vanderbilt International Office. Um, they uh, gave um, Peabody, uh, led by uh, Rogers and Kevin, um, this uh, seed grant for uh, a research exploration between the two universities and, um, and also the folks um, that really have um, the wonderful uh, intellectual curiosity and courage to uh, make trips to Australia um, that would include um, Ben Shapiro, a master's student then, a PhD student now, and Allison. Um, our, one of our uh, undergraduate students that just came back um, from studying uh, study abroad at University of Melbourne, and Rogers and Kevin, both of you um, for um, receiving my rambling long messages and, 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 and say, yes, we are interested. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then we have uh, Dave Owens from um, Owen Business School, and we have Jay. Uh, Clayton from the Curb Center, and these are some of the folks, Rogers, but probably I took your thunder um, of thanking. People can really kind of step outside of their boxes and then think about what possibilities could happen when working together. Um, so that's all I want to say, and uh, the rest of it's yours. I will also keep these introductions short. I want to introduce to you our three um, guests who are going to present in some kind of format. Um, I don't know if it's a panel or a tag team wrestling or exactly what, but they, um, the three of them in, in order right here are Ben Cleveland and uh, Claire Newton and Richard Leonard. And we're really pleased to have them as, um, as our special guests um, and I'd say as our, our friends as well as we develop this relationship and uh, learn from each other. And I was thinking about the three of them together, and, and not just individually, but how in many ways I think they represent exactly the kinds of relationships that we're trying to build across learning, uh, learning sciences, education and schooling, and design and architecture, because they have different varied histories in these areas that I think are so interesting for us. So starting with Richard Leonard, who is an architect in a, 
uh, for Hebel and a premier architectural firm in Australia that designed, uh, one, among many different projects, designed uh, templates that have been used for this reconceptualizing uh, architectural project in, in Australia, the BER project, and that was just fundamentally important for them. To Claire, who functions, uh, who comes out of architecture, and you're, you're going to need to correct me if I get this all wrong, but comes out of, and is a, a practicing architect, architect, comes out of architecture and has been pulled into uh, learning and thinking uh, deeply about learning and the design of learning environments as her career has moved along to uh, Ben, who's really trained as an education person who has, has always had an interest in space, draws on architectural uh, theories and also draws on critical uh, theories in his work. And so these kinds of, the ways in which they've been talking across fields are, are um, a really a des desire for us and an opportunity for us to, um, to model these kinds of dialogues for ourselves. So we're very pleased that you could come and uh, continue this relationship and friendship and we look forward to hearing from you. And I need to note um, before sitting down that uh, there is a reception after this and it is over in the Wyatt Center atrium. And so it'll immediately follow, allow us to continue talking to each other and with some food and drink. And please come there if you're not familiar with campus enough to know where that is. Somebody sitting next to you does know and, uh, you can, and we can help each other uh, make our way over there. So looking forward to that as well. Thank you. Um, thanks, Kevin. And um, I should say that we're, we've actually opted for the tag team wrestling <laughs> option in terms of how we present. So I'm a big fan of that. And uh, one of uh, the great imports from America to Australia, I've got to say, I, was, I sort of, I grew up on it. Um, if I could just introduce um, our team, and we're talking about three very different areas of really basically the same conversation. And um, We've really titled this uh, conversation with Vanderbilt because it just covers so much territory. Um, I myself, as uh, Kevin said, I'm an architect and with uh, Ben as a, a teacher and, and Claire is also sort of somehow straddling between the two. So we'll, we'll lead off with very, three very short, sharp presentations and then we're open to question and answers after that. Can I also say um, how bowled over we are by the invitation to, to come here. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity. As I said to the team, um, the last time I was here was 1981. I came here because I just loved the film Nashville. I'm looking around the audience here and I'm thinking most of you actually weren't born before <laughs> the film Nashville came out, but uh, it's, uh, it's one of my uh, seminal moments, I think. So, um, what I, what I thought I'd really take you through is really just an architectural viewpoint um, of what's happening in Australia, what's happening particularly in, in our state of, of Victoria, and um, to really build the groundwork for the theory that both Claire and, um, and Ben are going to talk about. And really just a little bit about myself. I, I sort of term myself a, an education tragic. Um, any, anything with education on the front of it, I'll be there. Um, I've, I've, it's something that I'm really passionately committed to. Um, I've uh, been involved in the education sector in terms of designing in my firm, uh, Hable Architects in, in Melbourne, uh, for something like 25 years. I'm involved in, in, in actually, this is another connection, but the uh, CFP, the, the Council of Education Facility Plan is international. Um, which is an American-based organization which we started in Australia 10 years ago. It's been here for, I think, about 120 years or so from memory. has around about 3,000, um, uh, 3,500, I think, um, people in America. We're, we're only up to about nearly 600 in Australia. But it's an organization just basically trying to get the conversation between architects and designers and educationists together. It's, uh, you know, just to sort of talk the same language and fundamentally to develop facilities that support teaching and learning in a contemporary context. And my hat I wear, I think, here also is with the University of Melbourne. We're involved as a linkage partner. That is, my firm is involved as a linkage partner in three Australian Research Council grants, which uh, Ben and, and Claire will talk through. And, um, and that's also been, from an architectural point of view, a fantastic uh, experience to really link research to design. Um, and really just, I suppose, to state the obvious, and, and these are things that you know, so we're not going to dwell on it, but it, it needs to be stated, you know, what fantastic drivers uh, have been 
uh, pushing education and, and education design, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years. But looking back, you know, what's happened in Australia, I'm sure it's exactly the same as what's happened here. You've had, you know, an overreaction to uh, the open plan schools that we had in the 70s. I think, you know, they, they sort of spread around the world pretty much. Um, we've all experienced uh, the problems of disengaged students in schools and, you know, the damage that that is, is causing. What, what has happened, though, recently in, um, in Australia, and particularly in the southern states of Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, is that we've had a very benevolent state government intervention in education. And particularly in the state of Victoria, where we all come from, um, that has been driving uh, innovative education um, and education design, uh, as I say, in the, in the past 10 years. And some of the big things, the last three, the, the really big things that are happening, you know all about it, you know, the, how technology has impacted education and the way we deal with education. Um, the rethinking of brain-based learning, how, um, you know, the complexities and, and understanding how people actually learn is, is, is really now being uh, better understood. And collectively, there is this rethinking of the education model and the pedagogies, etc. So, you know, they've driven what's been happening in Australia as much as anything. Now, the person that I'm meant to be representing today is, is Ken Fisher, who re regrettably at the last minute couldn't um, attend this conference. But Ken is a researcher and a person involved in education, uh, research and planning in Australia for, for a long time, has been instrumental also in, in uh, this document, which you can still get on the website, Pedagogy of Space. And this was produced for the um, Department of Education, the state uh, government in Victoria, to um, basically set the guidelines for designers and for schools to rethink education. And it's a really good capture of some of the basic principles. Here you'll see, you know, the matching pedagogy to space, um, picking up, you know, the rich variety of learning settings that is really part of the contemporary learning environment. And as I say, we'll, we can give you the uh, connection for that to the, the web. I think the other obvious thing is, you know, the changing nature of education. I attended a, an OECD conference in Vienna in, in 2010, which was, um, re it was called Reimagining uh, 21st Century uh, Education Environments. And Valerie Hannon uh, from the Innovation um, uh, Unit in the UK made this point about the changing nature of education, how, in fact, you've really got to rethink schools and rethink the education and rethink the schools. Her point was that if you don't, you, you'll suffer from institutional bypass. That is that, um, you know, either students or, or parents will bypass that school because it's not, you know, doing what it needs to do. It's not engaging with the students. They'll go to the next school or, they'll, you know, worse still, they'll drop out of the education system. And I think, you know, again, from a designer's point of view, this, this uh, simple uh, pyramid is a really good capture of um, what, what is the best way to teach and learn. And the fact that, you know, the bottom part of the, uh, the pyramid, you know, the practice and the teaching of others is actually one of the most or some of the most powerful uh, methods to, to actually learn. So, you know, again, it's getting away from that very didactic, um, uh, we sort of call it uh, chew and spew. Uh, I don't know what you call it here, but, you know, that very uh, lecture format, I suppose, uh, of, of uh, delivering education. John Hattie is, is a New Zealander who is uh, based at the University of Melbourne now and has also made um, a really good comment about what it, what it means to, um, uh, or how do you define visible learning? You know, and it's really flipping of this education when teachers see through the eyes of the student and the student um, themselves see themselves as the, their own teachers. So, you know, really the summary of all of that is, is what we've got with teaching environments at the, or, or the learning environments uh, and how they've changed is, is probably this sim simple summation of um, uh, uh, points. But I think the main point about this is what we're witnessing, I'm pretty sure it's the same here, but certainly in Australia what we're now witnessing is this is happening across all of the sectors, you know, from the elementary through to the college system in, in Australia. And just to quickly run through what that looks like, um, we thought we'd throw some exemplars in front of you, which is covering the elementary, uh, the middle and high, and the college areas. That's the state of Victoria. We're at the very bottom, uh, which is, um, ooh, sorry, the most, uh, we, we think, the best part of Australia. But uh, it's a small state in the south, which is the coldest. And um, 
I suppose one of the things that has hit Victoria dramatically in the last few years uh, that uh, Kevin alluded to was the Building the Education Revolution, which again I know you had a similar uh, federal program in, in the US. And in the state of Victoria, what that meant was um, $2.2 billion was spent in, in the infrastructure of the state system, which was just unbelievable. And it had, unfortunately, in one sense, nothing to do with education because it was purely a financial uh, stimulus package to, to uh, break through the uh, global financial crisis. But also at the same time, it made a step change in, in education facilities. And it was money that was well overdue. And this, is the, this little map is just indicating uh, the spread of schools in Victoria um, and also uh, you know, what that means in the, the metropolitan area. You know, overall, there were nearly you know, 1,500 schools by the time you add in all the other uh, sectors uh, that were being dealt with by the BER. And ooh, I'm running a slide behind, I'm sorry. So there, there, there is the capture of the, um, the map of Victoria, how it's affected us, and really just to bring it back to the Tennessee context, <laughs> Victoria, even though it's one of the smallest states, is still pretty big. I mean, I feel like Crocodile Dundee, you call Tennessee a state? <laughs> 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 and what we were involved in was very quickly, um, because money had to be injected into the economy um, as quickly as possible, was developing a series of templates, and there were about 22 in all that were spread across the state system. The really good part of this was that it was indicating, um, and here's one of the templates, it was, it was developing work with um, some educationists that were really looking at how uh, the pedagogy would work in these spaces. Um, it was designing on the basis that every square meter, every square foot of learning space was a learning space or of, of building space was a, was a learning opportunity. And it was trying to inject a series of uh, a, a variety of rich learning contexts in the buildings that really could support education in both ways. So, I mean, it was a it was dramatic work that had to be done and you didn't know where these things were going to be helicoptered in and you didn't know how people were going to use them. But what Claire is going to cover is, is later a, a little bit of the, the, um, the sort of the feedback and, uh, that's occurred since uh, the University of Melbourne has done some research on how it's worked. This is what they look like. Um, here's um, a shot of uh, probably one of the seminal primary schools in uh, Victoria, which was done by an um, associate of ours, Mary Featherston, who's an interior designer. And, she produced this Warana Park Primary School about 15 years ago, and it it's, was done on the sm smell of an oily rag, but it was really intensely working with staff and teachers uh, uh, and, and students and um, working with a very new way of delivering education. So what you'll see again is you know, a really rich set of um, environments all done within a, a very simple uh, existing building. And here also was some work was actually done in, in Victoria, but in association with some American architects, a firm called Field, Fielding Nair International, you might have heard, I think they're based in New York. But they were instrumental in um, working directly to the Department of Education in Victoria in rethinking um, you know, the design basis of schools. In middle and high schools, we've, we've been involved in um, one project, Dandenong High School, um, which has been subject again to some research by the University of Melbourne, which is developing a, a, what we call a Swiss model, nothing to do with the country, it's schools within schools, and really trying to break down the learning cohorts into uh, you know, staff, student, uh, collaborate, or, or, or cohorts that could work between the, staffs and the staff and the students. This, this slide is simply showing the, the sort of the rich um, understanding of all of the learning environments that we tried to identify, in trying to pin down the pedagogy. And it started actually in these dreadful relocatable buildings. This was sort of a seed project. Um, we decked out the, the, um, this simple relocatable building that um, was really a trial horse. So it was um, um, demonstrating how the spaces could work. And then finally bringing those spaces into the final floor plan again, which is 
not worth going through this um, uh, in any great detail. We don't have the time. But here's what it looks like. And what you'll see, for instance, in this slide is um, there are no standard classrooms. It's kids working in a series of different settings in different spaces. Um, it's about the flow of learning. All these spaces are very interconnected. You know, technology is uh, pervasive. There's indoor, outdoor uh, areas. Down the bottom is a science area that breaks out. So the, the external space is also used as a learning opportunity. And also at Camberwell High School, a similar project actually we've been involved in, which was really looking at breaking, a, in this case, a year nine. So it's a middle, middle or is that high? Probably high school here, but a, a cohort of 200 students working across independent instruction action, uh, activities, uh, collaborative areas, design, etc. And that came up in a series of definitions of these working spaces. So it's really, if you like, it's work-based activity design. It's really thinking, well, what do you got to do and how do you bring that into the design? Um, and all of those little, you know, the nuts and bolts that have to go with that learning uh, space are identified in these little captures. Uh, wet studios, media studios, and you know, that's the impact of technology was a very important part of, of this. And we ended up producing what was called a, a little driver's manual. So we could hand this little book over to the staff and say, this is the way that the spaces were conceived. This is how they're meant to work. And here's all of the, you know, the uh, sort of the intelligence and the, the, the pedagogical thinking behind the scenes. And what it looks like is, is again, this. What you won't recognize is any, you know, sort of standardized classroom spaces. Um, uh, you know, again, it's about the flow of learning. All spaces are interconnected. Uh, the central space was actually this table that was seen as, as sort of conceived as the, the dining room table, the kitchen table of the whole facility. And, you know, the kids have these opportunities to work in, you know, a series of different ways and the staff to work in a series of different ways. And also, again, ex externally, you know, breaking the internal spaces out to the external spaces. And really, just finally, I thought we'd look at the, the college sector and just a couple of examples that have happened recently at the, the Melbourne uh, University. And this is interesting because what they've done is it sort of looked at the way they're delivering education, particularly with the old lecture theatres, you know, spaces not dissimilar to this, but really thinking there is a better way to go. And so a couple of spaces that have been really effect, uh, effective learning spaces has been um, this one, firstly, which was, it's called Chem West. It was old uh, chemical laboratory. And probably translated a little bit like the MIT Teal project that um, I, I think started about t 10 years ago. But this is probably taking it to another level in terms of a highly collaborative space, which is about small groups getting together, you know, working as a larger group, but being able to focus across a whole set of different uh, learning areas. Um, and Peter Jamison, a, a, an associate professor from the University of Melbourne, was, was uh, instrumental in uh, conceptualising this. But as he put it, you know, the spaces um, it was about the three Ps in his view. It was about perspective, that is, seeing the design actually from the student perspective, not the designer's or the teacher's perspective, about transferring the pedagogy. And it's about making a place, not a space, making it a place for people, about the human aspects. And a similar one was the Kimpton Theatre, and this is the, the final slides, uh, set of slides I'll show, but um, Glyn Davis, the, um, the Vice Chancellor of Melbourne University, made the comment that, um, you know, what do you have to provide when st uh, to students to engage them in the campus if you actually, you know, they don't need to be there. Um, so it's, it's an interesting rethinking of the University of Melbourne's campus. And again, this is just taking a, a very dumb uh, lecture theatre and um, turning it into uh, this collaborative learning space, which uh, has a lot of similarities to Kim, Kim West. Um, again, it's, it's showing a series of spaces that are, are collaborative, that have technology as part of the discussion, um, and you know, have a, I suppose, you know, the, the simple capture is that rich variety of spaces. So I suppose just in summary, the, the three design drivers from my point of view as an architect and a, as a designer involved in education is just understanding how learning has changed and how that affects uh, you know, the things we do. And the fact that students need to be engaged, again, it's coming back to those three Ps. We need to see things from the student's perspective, not, not you know, the designer's or the, the teacher's perspective. And really also, you know, trying to bed down this monster of what is 21st century teaching and learning, you know, what is the model? 
And finally, um, this slide in a sense captures something that I found really motivating um, when we handed over, in fact, the Campbell High School project uh, earlier this year. And this was, you know, 200 kids in one year nine building. But about six months later, one of, one of the star, uh, one of the sorry, one of the uh, students came up to the uh, the principal of the school, and she knew that uh, next year she was moving out of this year nine building back into their old buildings in year ten. So as she said to the principal of the school, but but Miss, how do I learn next year? Because the fact of the matter was, you know, the, the students had taken to these new facilities like Ducks to Water. They know better how to work in these spaces than we do. And, you know, I think it's a real interesting dilemma and a challenge that we have about how they transition from those facilities and sometimes, unfortunately, back into the old ways of doing things. So on that, I'll hand over to Claire. If we can transfer this slideshow, I think you fired up. On the If um, Richard's an education <coughs> tragic, I'm an education groupie, if, if that's a word you use. I, I follow educators and I admire them intensely because they think quite differently to architects and they get things done very, very quickly. Whereas architects, we think about things and we live in in imagine spaces for quite a while before we make a commitment. I'd also like to thank particularly Sho for enabling this to happen and, and, and um, having the persistence to um, keep with us. And it was fantastic. We were funded by the Dyson um, grant body at the University of Melbourne, but then Rogers, David and Kevin managed to get matching funding from um, Vanderbilt. So it was great having you out in Melbourne, both virtually and physically. We had David attend virtually. And then we had the bonus. He had a bonus of Ben coming and playing with us for a little while. So as, um, as um, Kevin mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the research projects that we've been doing, which have been collaborations between um, industry and um, academics. It's also been collaborations between architecture and um, educators. There's three projects. Um, the first one is Smart Green Schools, our very first one that we began five years ago. The second one is Future Proofing Schools, which has only just finished, or our PhD student is still three months from <laughs> finishing. And the final one is, is brand new, so I'll introduce that very, very briefly. So. Um, as we look at the Australian Research Council grants, we have two kinds of funding. We have discovery funds where academics can work reasonably independently, but then the government recently, maybe a decade ago, initiated a new kind of funding to encourage conversations between town and gown. And industry puts money in. Richard's firm funded this project. and. The funds from Richard's firm, from education departments, from other firms, get geared by government funding. So it means that over three years, you can do quite a lot of work, you have quite a lot of manpower, and you can gradually shift cultures. But they're high risk, you often don't get them, they take a long time, and often industry wants answers quickly, within a month, so it takes a particular kind of industry to understand that this is, this is a, a, a somewhat different form of research rather than consultancy. Smart Green Schools, this is a project which was instrumental to our thinking behind Smart Green Schools. It's won by Richard's firm and it won the inaugural Minister's Award for Best School but, but what actually was a critical moment for us was realising that this image of it brand new and this image of it occupied Really the only difference was the doors were shut and this space, which I think the firm had envisaged to be quite a le lively learning area, was not actually being used. And we started to think about the reasons behind this and understood that it's just not enough to provide new spaces alone. You actually need to think quite holistically. You do, as the word today, we were thinking about the kind of ecology of learning. We had two PhD students, if I go back, 
five researchers, nine industry partners, two PhD students, and Ben was one of the PhD students, but we also had an architect who worked on this, and he was interested in mapping space and then reflecting with the teachers on what was happening during um, education sessions. This is mapping a teacher and two students, a male and female, during a 90-minute lesson. And the teacher was staggered to see where she was walking during that 90-minute session. The male student didn't move, and the female student moved very little. And we're finding that that's now changing in these new spaces that Richard had described. Ken, in particular, was thinking about this term flexibility and trying to understand what a flexible space might look like. And traditionally, we've understood flexible spaces to perhaps be a little bit like this, where we can move the furniture around. You can do whatever you like by moving the furniture around. And we're perhaps a little critical about that. And we're adopting a language which Mary Featherstone, also one of our linkage partners, has given us, where she speaks about purposeful spaces, spaces which give clues to both the teachers and the students about how they might work. And instead of the furniture being moved, the furniture might be more stable, but the students can actually pick themselves up and move according to where they need to be. Mary's also given us this language where we think about the building and we think about the spaces, but we understand that the building has furnishings, but then the building is also personalised, and that personalisation is crucial. If spaces aren't owned by any one class of students, can you ever get to this point of personalisation? Ben has also been working with us, and um, Ben will talk a little bit more about one of his three case studies. But I'm going to introduce it because it's the thing that directly led into our next, um, our next piece of research. What was, what was interesting about this space is it was an absolutely conventional school, brand new school, um, cutting edge in terms of environmental sustainability, but in terms of teaching and learning, it's straight classrooms. Except for one last minute decision, where the principal managed to get some innovation funding for an open plan classroom, and what he did was he removed the walls, and he thought, yep, that'll work. It was a disaster. <laughs> it was a complete disaster. The students were in there for two 45-minute periods per week. Nobody owned the space. The teachers hated it. They would take the students to the library if they possibly could. And Ben had the initiative as part of his PhD to bring together the team, the research team, our partners like Richard and Mary came along and worked with the staff across a half day to think about the space, to think about the difficulties of the space. And as a result of this, there was a new kind of innovation, a new insertion, which transformed that open plan into purposeful settings. But, so that was that little project. At the back of that school, the teacher the architect took us on a tour of the school and said, oh, we were really pleased to be able to put these relocatables down the back. Every school just about in Australia has relocatables because we have communities that are fluctuating in terms of their um, age groupings. And so schools will have a maximum enrolment, but then they'll shrink back again. And so these relocatables, they form a really great purpose. But in some states, they accommodate up to 30% of students, and they're ignored because they're thought of as temporary. Here we go. Across all states of Australia, we have these relocatables, and they're the second rate, the poor cousin classrooms. And so our question was, what about prefabricated learning environments that look good enough to be at the front of the school? And we thought there might have been some tipping points um, going on, and that was that, that helped us develop this next research project, which we're just finishing up with now. And these tipping points are the ones that um, Richard's introduced in terms of 21st century learning, in terms of technology. But within the prefabrication industry, we're seeing new CAD CAM technologies, mass customization coming from the car industry. In Australia, we've had a construction labor shortage, which is probably going to get worse as People from the construction industry move to other industries. You know, in the recent past, it's been moving into the mining sector. 
But also we're thinking more in terms of systems and bespoke possibilities. We're thinking more about outdoor learning. We see that we're going to have to adapt to this um, change. And I I'm still amazed that the very conservative Australian Research Council funded this project because what we did was threw in a design ideas competition in the middle year of a three-year project. So in the first year, we developed a brief and we sent that brief out to industry in this format but also in an online format where we tried to capture the kind of best practice across the world. We looked at prefabrication in Japan, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the USA, in England. We looked at 21st century pedagogies. We went to remote Australia, looked at the kind of prefab um, um, possibilities for very, very isolated areas in Australia. It's a big continent. We sent it out to industry and we got 120 entries. We got winners from four countries. And then in the second year, we ran the competition and had a judging process. We were looking at ideas for 10 years' time. We critiqued what was submitted in that third year. But what's been really interesting and unexpected was a couple of weeks ago, one of the competition entries has been transformed into a real building. So for us, that's been unexpected and incredibly exciting. Christchurch suffered an earthquake recently. A lot of schools were damaged. One of the other winners is getting built in Christchurch. So for us, that's been a wonderful outcome. Um, we developed four what we thought were equally important research strands, looking at 21st century sustainable school environments, how the building sat within the landscape rather than looking like an object from out of space, and the prefabrication techniques. And some of our winners, um, you know, we, we were intrigued by how many different strategies. The first one presented the design as an, as an app something that staff and students could pick and choose and mix and match in a kind of jigsaw puzzle. This one, which is the one being built in Christchurch, looked at a new structural system entirely, a new prefabrication strategy. This one, another winner from the student um, category, looked at mass customisation strategies. And there's 120 online examples that people can look at. A PhD student in this case focused on indoor environment comfort and she's developed some really interesting modelling tools which Ben is going to talk about more in the next um, minute or so. So she's trying to understand from quantitative data but also qualitative data how the spaces are appreciated and there's been some real surprises. Some of the new spaces have been the worst performing and She's got some great stories about that. And, um, you know, we often find in these relocatables that the windows are covered up completely and understanding why that happens. So in summary, um, these are the things that we've been looking at, the changes in teaching, issues around sustainability and issues around prefabrication. Our third research project, which is just beginning, it's a watch this space, is trying to find evidence based data for whether these new spaces are making a difference. And there are three parallel research methodologies to investigate, or research methods perhaps I should say, to investigate this key question of how well they perform. Um, one is sort of much more involved in conversations with teachers, another is an expert elicitation where we go very broadly to find out across the world what sustains um, and defines new spaces. And the final one is looking at longitudinal studies as students progress from secondary schools into tertiary environments. So what are our lessons for the future? These inclusive conversations, I think, can't be overemphasised, but they're really difficult. They need nurturing to flourish. They're surprisingly difficult and in a banal way they're difficult even at the level of conversation of words. We use different words 
So educators will be familiar with these words, but may not be familiar with the words used within um, design. But there are structural differences. There are faculties in universities, which mean that you know, conversations across faculty are hard. Continue with what we're doing well, and there's a lot of things that are, that are being done well here, across the United States, across Australia, and building on those. But also encouraging next practice, or beacon projects, acupuncture points, um, acorn seeds. Um, and some of the work that LEARN's been doing is trying to understand what are the factors that enable sustainable, innovative, enable innovative environments to be sustainable. Because sometimes they take a lot of energy, but then they fail, like we saw in the 70s. Agile spaces, perhaps, rather than flexible spaces. I just want to say technology. It's much easier, I think, to deal with technology than it was even five years ago when we had the computer labs. I think now technology is much more seamless in, in spaces. Um, but also there's so much potential with technology to enable students to work in quite different ways. They don't need to be so tied into this kind of setting where we talk in a one-way um, mode. So my last question is, our classrooms, have they passed their use-by date? But maybe we can even be a bit bolder and wonder whether schools, perhaps in themselves, have passed their use-by date. Do we have a new kind of environment where our students learn? Do we need to develop a new kind of language to describe these spaces? So with that, I'll move on to Ben, and thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Claire, and um, and again, I'd just like to thank everyone for inviting us to come. And um, I think probably we've, we've named those people who should be named. And so, thank you again um, to everyone. Um, I, I just wanted to put the, uh, the the title slide up again. Um, when Rogers sent this one through, I said yes. This is uh, this is a terrific title slide. Uh, it matches. Is that flicked over? With uh, the title of a project that we ask uh, some of our master's uh, students to work on. Um, we have a, a, an elective which has been running for three years, which um, our research through the Smart Green Schools project um, uh, was distilled into. Um, and the subject's called Innovative Spaces and Pedagogy. And we ask uh, groups of four, two educators and two architects, to work collaboratively on a project which is titled The Industrial Model, What Next? And it's very much based around um, Newman's ideas about authentic learning. Uh, it's based around constructivism. Uh, and there's a couple more, I think, here somewhere. And, and we asked them to uh, investigate how they would see the future of education and educational environments and what they would like those to look like. So when I saw the what next, I thought, yeah, we, we, we're, um, we're right in line with the thinking on that. I thought as a way of trying to communicate some of the learnings from five years of research, I'd just sort of tell a story about um, some of the research that's gone into those, that subject. And we've got a new one starting next year called um, Physical Learning Environments Affecting Pedagogic Change. Um, and, and just kind of weave together, rather than talking about individual projects, kind of weave together some of the thinking that's come out of the work that we've done, which in a lot of ways, if I can click on to the next one here, um, revolves around answering three really simple questions, which both Claire and, and Richard have both um, alluded to already. But you know, this idea about um, asking people the provocations, you know, how do students learn? Uh, what does effective and really valuable learning look like? Um, what are people actually doing in order to engage with that? Um, and how can we create learning environments to support those modes or modalities of learning? And so they're the sorts of things we ask our students to do. But it's also really the basis um, for our ongoing research program. Um, it's sort of set against the backdrop of quite substantial education reform, I guess, in Victoria. It's kind of a nice opportunity to come and talk to people who aren't in the midst of this um, and be a little bit objective. Um, so I think it's fair to say that there's been quite substantial change in the direction um, and the accepted um, kind of uh, approach to education in our state in particular and probably Western Australia more so than some of the other states, but the others are quickly catching up. Um, and so conversations uh, around what does personalised learning look like, um, 
interdisciplinary learning, perhaps teachers acting more in the facilitator role, um, inquiry-based, problem-based, I'll click through a few more of these, problem-based, team teaching becoming something which is um, more common uh, in a lot of schools than not, uh, which has been a big cultural change, and we have a number of research students uh, investigating models of collaboration and such, such like to try and understand you know, the, the exemplar uh, models for teaching, team teaching. Uh, more experiential, um, you know, calling a lot on, on Vygotsky and ideas about constructivism, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, more connected, more equitable. Um, there's kind of an overarching narrative about de um, democratic education as well, um, and that, that, that the power structures um, that exist in classrooms being much flatter than they have been in the past. Um, and obviously, you know, this issue of ICT and the impact on that. So that's, that's kind of the, the educational context that we're working in, and I'm not sure how that maps to here, but that's the conversations that, that we're all having um, in Victoria. I guess the other background um, issue is this, this uh, one that comes up a lot when um, people talk about more innovative environments, and that's the issue of the 1970s open plan and the perception that that was a failure. Um, and there is a little body of research about this and the reasons for that. But there are also schools which, um, including this one, which I attended myself um, in Melbourne called Press Hill, which um, have, uh, were born out of the 1960s, moved through the 1970s, and continued, while everyone else didn't, um, on the merry way. And uh, suddenly they feel like you know, they're the leaders and everyone's catching up to them. So there's kind of a backdrop around progressivism and uh, open plan, which we also talk about quite a bit. Um, this is some floor plans for, for some of the school buildings which um, I'm happy to say I enjoyed a lot when I was uh, in elementary school. Uh, but I think there's also, th this is pretty accepted um, in Melbourne, uh, that this, this is the problem. <laughs> because all of those things which I had, the many words I had on the slide, become very, very difficult to do in, in environments uh, like that. There's a lot of environmental cues to suggest to you that you should not be talking to the person next to you uh, and the power structures are pretty obvious. So um, that, that's the problem. Um, if I click through here. So I guess the overarching kind of narrative here um, and the overarching sort of project in that sort of sociological sense is that we're looking at designing for complexity and non-linearity. Um, and that's a pretty big project. Um, involves lots and lots of people doing experiments uh, and doing research. And we see our role as um, trying to provide some feedback loops uh, and trying to identify people who are, who are making a lot of progress in this area and learning from them and disseminating some of the great things they're doing. Um, and I guess based in the literature too. So uh, we've been looking at you know, people thinking about complexity and philosophy and what impacts ideas about complexity have for education. And I just wanted to make special mention of some of the work of Rena Upatis from um, Queen's College in, in uh, Ontario, who um, I was very happy when I discovered that she uh, assessed my PhD thesis and uh, was very generous. Um, but I base a lot of my work uh, on her early work around um, school architecture and complexity as well. So. Um, there's kind of an, an, an overarching and underwriting um, ideas around what, what is complexity and ideas about complexity and sociology mean for, for education and, and school design. Um, and that kind of leads into just talking a little bit more about LEARN. Uh, LEARN is our, uh, the name of our research group, Learning Environments Applied Research Network. Uh, and although Claire talked about our um, particular ARC projects, LEARN kind of is our, our through line. Learn um, is uh, kind of runs on a on a very limited budget. Um, at the moment, it kind of employs me, um, <laughs> which is great, and uh, <laughs> and, and will for an well, another. Five people. Though. Five people at work. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get a lot of help, and uh, and so I just make sure that certain things happen. But it's it is a very collaborative in environment, and we have partners. Richard's one of our partners, and his firm Hayball, and and, and others, including our quite substantial Catholic education office um, who are one of the founders as well. And, and so LEARN, we do little projects on a regular basis and that sort of seeds the bigger grant applications and so forth. And so this, this model's been really helping us um, to explore things that might need exploring and some of them are dead ends and some of them really flourish into, uh, into bigger projects. Um, and I should say that it's, it's collaboratively 
The core funding comes from uh, the architecture building and planning faculty, um, the Graduate School of Education, and also the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, um, who joined a couple of years ago. And, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the influence that they've had on, on the directions of our work too. Um, this, this I just wanted to put up because it's uh, one, of the, one of the things that kind of captures, uh, I think, the, the various stakeholder interests uh, in learning environments. Uh, and also shows that uh, the, the, the conversations are very cyclical. There's, not, there's a lack of linearity in the conversations that we have around learning spaces as well. Um, my good friend and fellow PhD student on Smart Green Schools, and I put this together for a conference earlier this year, and the whole idea was to talk about how do you really get um, contemporary learning environments to work uh, effectively. And of course, we don't have all the answers, so we took this to the conference and we, we, uh, we asked people to play a game. Uh, to explore all the issues rather than solve them. We just wanted to put them on the table. Um, I'm not sure if the cursor works. Can you see that? I don't think you can see the cursor. No. Um, I'll go through in colour coordination. So there's no real starting point, but I guess the most logical um, place to start is yellow um, up at the top. And so we really feel that you know, there's conversations that are very important for learning environment design and occupation um, to do with creating educational philosophies and visions for learning. Um, and that those conversations um, are really the basis, I guess, for any further thinking. Um, and, and that really needs to be distilled into what are the actual pedagogies um, that are going to be enacted. And there's people who, have, who need to have really important conversations about that. Uh, moving on then to, to thinking about design uh, and those earlier conversations informing that, as Richard said, and also the construction process. Um, to shifting into um, occupation and occupying new learning environments. And that not being a matter of walking in on day one. Um, I'm reminded of the story at Dandenong High School, which Richard talked about, when uh, the school principal took some of the teachers in, and the first question was, where's the front? Uh, <laughs> where do I stand to teach? I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. And that was a serious aha moment for them, because they realised that even with two years of professional learning, that perhaps they hadn't targeted um, that appropriately and since then they've rectified that situation there is no front um, and the the system um, is, a, is a very different one uh, and requires quite different planning on the teachers part and lastly this issue of post occupancy evaluation uh, and how do you know if things are working and how do you know how you can improve things that aren't um, and so the cycle goes on and on and there's no one stakeholder who really actually is involved in everything so that's why the collaborations are so important you know, I, I guess the schools and the community, the education community is involved in almost all of it, but they're certainly not involved in construction itself. Um, but other people have great influences um, at various points on the cycle, and the cycle, it's kind of like an action research cycle that goes on and on um, throughout. The other, the other thing that I just wanted to share with you too is um, some work from someone I believe was in one of the other departments here, Torin Monaghan, and uh, he's moved on to another university, but uh, in fact, I think he's actually working on quite different things now, but in uh, 2000 he um, published a paper about built pedagogies, which um, we found particularly useful. Uh, and this idea that there's this continuum um, of spaces from highly controlled, sorry, I can see it, but you can't, um, really highly controlled spaces or disciplined spaces, right, right across the gamut to really um, autonomous spaces, which might be more attuned to the kind of environments that, that, we lo that we're familiar with in libraries. Um, and that these have quite different sort of pedagogical implications. Um, and so we've been exploring those things and thinking about, you know, as network diagrams in this particular case, you know, what, what sort of environments for didactic delivery, um, for assessment, for large groups, for small groups, for groups that are supposed to interact, for groups that are meant to be working with greater independence the opportunities to be really um, isolated and to engage in some really reflective um, sort of learning as well and so I'm trying to incorporate a lot of these things into the spaces that students occupy um, as being a goal and, and I guess this is one of the learnings that when you do this really effectively um, these spaces work a lot better. And so we've been thinking about what's possible you know, what sort of teaching and learning are possible in some of the spaces that have been developed in Victoria. Um, this is an elementary example, uh, middle school. Uh, not every school has bean bags, but um, kids do like them. Uh, senior, senior high school. Uh, this is a project that I actually worked on myself, uh, which has recently been built, and this is the sort of the learning commons 
that a lot of other spaces bleed into, and also a space which um, we've got at our own, at our university, uh, which is called the Learning Environment Spatial Laboratory, and it's actually intended to be an experimental space for people to test ideas about what um, pedagogies and space and how these things might um, come together. Um, has won a number of awards. And I get to teach innovative spaces and pedagogy in it, which is um, a, a great benefit as well. Uh, I might skip quickly over this. I kind of think I might be running out of time. Um, so I think Claire and, and Richard have mentioned many of these things. But you know, what have been the drivers that we've identified? And very, very briefly, you know, this, this idea that the cells and bells model has been holding back pedagogical innovation. And if you do think about space more carefully, you can actually really provide an opportunity um, through initially disruption, but later um, so some really emergent practice that can be very positive uh, can come about. Um, I guess there's a strong connection with ideas around constructivism um, and improving the overall experience of school. And I think that was alluded to earlier as well when we talked about why would students come to campus if they don't have to. Um, you know, greater internal uh, social cohesion. Um, the school within schools model, again, that Richard talked about, was very much about instead of being one of 2,100, why not be one of 300 within a school campus and what sort of internal social cohesion, um, what are the benefits of that? Um, connectedness, uh, ideas about curriculum integra integration as well and that the siloed approach um, has great limitations um, in the way students think and, and the way they learn. Um, thinking about Design really is an enabler of um, imagining new educational futures. Um, I think sometimes we get stuck thinking about um, you know, the space inside students' heads and what they're doing cognitively, and we forget that it actually has a material um, basis as well, and so that gives you another avenue for thinking about education itself. Uh, you know, think, rethinking curriculum and pedagogy frameworks in the context of space yet again. And what's the last one? Oh, and also this, this idea, and particularly Mary Featherston's work, which again was talked about, was this sort of cultural transmission of understandings of what, um, how you can enact pedagogy um, when you talk about the spatial and the material and how that actually leads to better understandings around how you would engage in, in different practice. Claire talked about this one. I won't introduce it, but I will just um, sort of show you a plan of, of, of the outcomes of that and that thinking around the built pedagogies, um, the types of environments, the types of envir environmental cues that really um, enabled uh, a richer learning experience for the students and a much, much improved experience for the teachers, I've got to tell you. Um, it was a space which, uh, as Claire said, they'd prefer to be in the library. So in many ways, we kind of created a library-like space where there was... Um, interconnection, flow, opportunities for a variety of different settings. Um, and you can see some of the, the early ideas that were drawn into, into this picture. And again, some of the, some of the artist's drawings of that um, being there. But in terms of effectiveness, um, you know, and that providing that feedback, um, you, you can't talk about space and the enactment of, of education without it aligning well with the intended practice. So I think schools, um, when, when they aligned their pedagogy, the curriculum, and even the types of assessment practice, um, that was the one that caught out a lot of schools early on in Victoria, that they hadn't understood that if you continue to sit very um, uh, sort of standardised tests, or that being the model of, of, of assessment, that that would restrict other development. Um, and so really rethinking um, how you might engage in assessment was, um, was, a, was kind of a key tipping point for a lot of these spaces actually being used in the ways that they had been intended, which of course were earlier informed by the desired practices themselves. And they function best when students take greater ownership of what they're doing um, around really rich frameworks that do take time to conceive and to communicate. Um, but if the students do work with that greater autonomy and they can interact directly and directly with their peers, their teachers, the technology, the resources, the levels of engagement, and that's what I studied in my PhD, was um, how does this impact on, on, on cognitive and behavioural and, and, um, and effective engagement, that they, they do rise quite substantially. And to give you an idea about one of the schools that we think um, have been doing this really rather well, uh, it's a, a relatively new school in Auckland, New Zealand called Stonefields. 
Uh, we're very fortunate to have their associate principal as one of our research students as well. Um, and this is a school where you'll see this happening in elementary classes um, on a regular basis. And it's, um, it, there's a lot of independent work, but there is direct instruction to small groups, as you can see with the small group kneeling around the low table. Um, and to go there and to talk to students who are six and seven years old around the process of learning and their metacognition of what they're doing is absolutely incredible. They can tell you all about how they learn, um, how they get over things that they find difficult, um, how they solve problems, and how self-directed they are um, comes as quite a shock, I think, to most people. And it's not a particularly affluent area, but the, the frameworks that they work within are really exceptional, and the spaces they've got work very much in keeping with what they do. I better move along quickly. Just to tell you, we do do a lot of research projects, little ones um, that, that, as I said, provide our sort of through line and give us an idea of what should be going on. This is kind of the list of activity for this year. Um, and some of it's to do with hospital learning environments, which I'll talk about in a minute. A lot's to do with schools still, but um, a lot of it's about evaluation of one kind or another. But one of the projects I will talk a little bit more about was um, this one, which had the rather long title of Developing and Sustaining Innovative Education Practices in Innovative Learning Environments, and um, kind of brought about through those BER template spaces in large degree, uh, whereby people really wanted to understand how do you get from we'd really love to be doing some of these things in these buildings that people talk about as education reform initiatives I showed up earlier how do we get there what what's the process for getting there um, and we bit off a lot so we suggested we would look at the social cultural physical technological political and economic issues <laughs> and then they're the themes under that which then had many many sub themes um, under those as well and so it was it was quite a lot um, to sort of take in and so I guess the, the thing I'm communicating here is that it, it holistic system change is quite a big undertaking um, but I think through this project we identified some of the things that are important if you are to um, to decide to go down that path um, just to pick out one of the things um, to do with uh, the social um, and this idea of social innovation, which Dave, you might want to critique this as someone who learns a lot about innovation. Um, that, you know, there's, there's a whole range of um, people involved and processes from, from leadership. Um, in exemplar uh, case studies, we found that one of the interesting things about leadership was being intentionally disruptive um, in a way to allow emergent practices and so forth to happen. And, and um, that kind of came as a kind of an interesting surprise that people would intentionally disrupt. Um, but it makes sense. Um, so, you know, how do you involve staff? So that idea of co-construction being really important. Um, bringing in the other stakeholders. Overcoming what you might call organisational fixation. How do you think beyond what you do now? Um, professional learning play a really key role, and particularly that which is based on modelling, rather than just telling people what they should be doing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess the last one being your perspective on innovation and kind of understanding what innovation is. Um, and you can ask Dave, um, and he'll tell you the answer. <laughs> uh, the, the other, I guess the, the kind of the, 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 the thing that's been exciting and new for us um, was something which started up last, uh, let's see, 2012. We have an annual meeting. Um, and at the annual meeting in December 2012, um, we did actually call it a Talking Spaces, which is our conference title. Um, but it was invitation only and we invited people from the medical field to join us for a conversation around what are the issues around space and learning that they're interested in. And uh, what they were really interested in was, again, kind of in keeping with these ideas about complexity, um, the randomness and informality of health education, particularly that happening in hospitals, um, and that informal settings of health education are little understood and not very well conceived and don't even make it onto the briefing of hospital design. Um, so really people thinking about that. Um, wanting to understand better the modes and the pedagogical encounters that occur in hospitals uh, and the nature of what students, you know, in, in their latter years of their medical degrees, what do they actually learn uh, in hospitals um, being something which were people were particularly interested in as well. So we've been pursuing a project about that which we've um, really just finished data collection so I can't tell you much about the findings. But I guess we're sort of conceiving it in this way of coupling 
care models with education models and how could we bring those things um, closer together. Someone mentioned that, uh, I think it's Bonnie Miller, is interested in the 44 years of learning after you become a qualified doctor. Uh, and I think coupling care and education models a little better might help with, with those sorts of things. That's our Royal Children's Hospital, by the way, which um, has recently been uh, rebuilt at great cost, and it's a very exciting place to be, including the meerkat enclosure, which um, <laughs> is, a, is an awfully big hit, and I think people just go to the hospital just to enjoy that. <laughs> you don't have to be sick to enjoy this hospital. So some of the questions, and I'll, I'll keep moving through that, that we've been asking about, you know, how do you better understand uh, human, human environment interaction and learning in hospitals? And uh, thinking about how design and technology might enhance opportunities for that random or informal learning that might take place. So Claire and I in particular have been working on that um, for a while. I am going a bit over time here. Uh, I'll quickly just mention that we've been developing an instrument um, to do evaluation. Um, one's based on the work, uh, indoor environment quality work that um, Pippa Soccio has been doing in the Future Proofing Schools. Uh, and another one is about alignment of pedagogy and space and how do you actually get those things to align. Um, rather than just having a belief that all schools should be like this or this. It's really about understanding the context and the philosophy and the vision of individual schools and using that as the basis for evaluation rather than an outsider's perspective. So I'll, I'll flick through a couple of these um, just to try and finish off. Uh, we've been doing some video case studies too, including some of Richard's schools, um, looking at what the pedagogic practices actually look like in exemplar. Um, situations so that we can better communicate that across our own school system but um, to elsewhere as well. So that's been particularly interesting. Uh, and I inserted this one after our conversation earlier today where we're looking at partnering with um, Museum Victoria to look at effective encounters and uh, the role that um, uh, museum and collection uh, situations can bring and, and how the effect uh, mode can influence that. And I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you all. That was uh, great. I, uh, I want to open it up uh, to questions. And maybe some of the folks could come up to the front to answer those questions. I'll get closer to this. I just wanted to kind of start with an observation that uh, I guess 2008 or so, you start with a BER investment, that's a government investment in reimagining school spaces, $19 billion, I think, is the, is the tune to that? 16, yeah. $16 billion, okay. About the same time we started in this country with something called Race to the Top, which I believe is about $5 billion, but there may be people in the audience who know more about that level of spending. I've never seen that much money. Um, so in, in our case, I think what we are driving towards is standardized instruction and uh, value-added paper performance, value-added models of whether or not teachers are effective. Uh, and that's a very particular way of looking at it. In your case, you've driven towards green building supplies and infrastructure, a whole new way of thinking about the material of schools. And the idea that school spaces might be able to respond, response-able spaces to different forms of pedagogy. So these are, from my perspective, two historical case studies. Not enough time has passed yet to know really what the outcome of that will be, race to the top, uh, BER. But I just think that's fascinating. And I'm delighted that you guys are here to talk to us about it. Questions? Ideas? While you're thinking of some um, questions, with the templates that um, Richard's firm developed for the BER, they're quite interesting because they're a hybrid. They're a very uh, gentle introduction to different ways of teaching beyond the classroom because you still see the classroom boundary there, but the walls slide open so that classrooms can be interconnected with each other and interconnected to communal spaces. And, We've been doing some um, observations over the past three years since they've first been occupied in 2010. And what we're finding is that the, the, the staff are kind of settling comfortably into them. They haven't been too much of a, of a shock. And that's been a kind of positive outcome. And they 
are finding that they are opening the doors, the teachers are giving up their real estate within the classroom and working in collaborative spaces rather than, you know, taking possession of 20% of the classroom with their um, objects and desks. Fronts are disappearing in the classroom, so there's a kind of, it's a very gentle transition happening. Shut the mics off. Yeah. I, 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 I get this tension between the, the pedagogy of the space, and, I'm, and in the case studies that you've seen, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I work very closely with a couple of schools, and the, the pedagogical barriers for the teachers to being able to inhabit a space purposefully and agilely um, are, are significant. And so I'm curious about the extent where your teachers were in the places that you've experimented. Mm. Well, did you begin with what's leading? I, I, yeah, I, like mm. I, I can imagine ultimately that you get into this nice relationship where the one pushes the other, right? Mm. And then it goes back and forth. Mm. And, 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 and there's, there's two answers. I would say the correct answer is what should be leading. It must be the pedagogy that's driving change. I, I, I think there was a moment there where the infrastructure departments of our education um, bodies were pushing for innovation in space and hoping that pedagogy would come along behind and and I think that it didn't you might have a different yeah. answer Richard Look, I'll, I'll try to have a crack at this sorry yeah, I don't think that's working um, I think one of the, the really interesting things that we were involved in was we, we showed you a couple of slides with the Dandenong High School and we started that project and we really quickly realized we couldn't put pen to paper we couldn't start designing because the pedagogy hadn't been properly resolved and that the, the staff, the teachers, was, were thinking themselves about a, a very different way of working. You know, stepping out, as, as Ben said, stepping out of the single classrooms in, into team teaching is really difficult. So I, I think that the thing that we quickly, re quickly realised as designers, in fact, if we started designing, we would have subverted the process. And it would have been the worst thing we could have done was to put ideas down on the table because the more fundamental thing was to get the pedagogy understood, get that clear. And in fact, what happened in that, you know, normally what we do in, in, in Victoria is that the department will give you, say, three months to do a master plan. And in fact, the whole process took about 18 months. And we needed that time to properly define the pedagogy for the staff to become comfortable with that and for the design then to start a year after the process began. And, you know, in the last six months, that's when the, the actual design happened. And I think, you know, one person really put it very well to say, it's a bit like designing the plane when you're flying it. You know, it's schools, schools have to operate whilst you're, you're sort of reinventing the model. Oh, finished, I think. Oh, OK. Thank you. I might just um, remind everybody of those two images that I showed, which predated Dandenong High School, and they were by Richard's firm. And, and that, was, that was where I was saying that I think maybe the design was, a, was not responding to innovative pedagogy. It was trying to lead pedagogy. And it kind of wasn't successful because the educators weren't using the spaces effectively. They might be using them effectively now, but at that time it yep. was just closing the doors down. And I think that's probably the experience of that building even, or, or that range of buildings that pushed you in a different direction with Dandenong to take time to mm -hmm. allow the pedagogy to evolve. Well, one of the other aspects of that too um, is who's involved in design. And, and so depending on your, this is now working I think, Depending on your perspective, so if you've been uh, you know, in a school leadership role or actively um, participating you know, with the architects and, and, and um, developing the pedagogical strategies and seeing how they're embodied in the architecture, that's quite a different experience if you're a teacher who hasn't been involved in that and it's like a spaceship's landed at your school and you don't actually understand it. So one of the things that I think we've found is that active involvement of um, pretty much everyone in a school, if this is possible, um, for new schools it's not, but for other schools that may be getting new facilities, um, thinking about how do you actually integrate everyone into that process and that they, they follow the story, um, so they follow the development of the thinking, is really, really enabling once they get there, once they get to occupation, um, and that they understand where the ideas were generated from and, and how you could pursue them once you're in the space. Mm. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was Richard's term, cells and bells, Richard, you're talking yeah, about the, that. The, the question was, what does it mean, cells and bells? Yeah, and, and look, uh, I think, it, look, it's the very glib, uh, I suppose, summary of, of the traditional industrial model of education, which is cellular, and you, and you work between the, you know, the bells of each particular period, and, you know, 50 minutes later, in your you know five minutes you've got to get to mathematics instead of science so you know uh, there's lots of terms of that that sort of uh, you know is uh, is capturing that but I think you know Ben showed that picture of the problem being the standardized classroom and you know that is a serious thing that we're trying to overcome and do it you know a with not a lot of money be with limited understanding and as Claire said you know particularly with staff I think teachers are having trouble understanding the new mental models of education when you can't see and touch it there aren't that many mental models out there I think they are becoming much more uh, common and one of the two of the most powerful things I think we've struck for um, extracting the project brief, if you like, or getting the understanding of the education model. Firstly, is site visits, going out and visiting some of these innovative schools and talking to teachers and uh, talking to kids. And, you know, that is one of the most powerful things you can do because it's, you know, it's peers talking to peers. The other thing, I think, is, is working this process of what we call ACORNs or, um, you know, starter projects, Trojan horses. And it's providing spaces that staff can actually trial themselves. And in fact, as, as we said, with Danny Long High School, we did that for a, for a whole year in this, this uh, terrible little relocatable building. But it was really effective from the staff's point of view because all of a sudden they could work in the space, they could work within a team, they could modify the, the spaces, they could feed back to the, the design team and say, look, this isn't working or this is really effective. And in fact, that process was ongoing whilst the building was being built because we had to work to a very specific uh, time span. But um, what was happening was the staff were trialling the facility that was feeding back then into the design and then feeding directly into the construction whilst it was happening. So they're, but they're good techniques. Those two, two lessons are very good techniques. Has that answered your question? <laughs> I can think of so many ways in which you might judge the occupancy to be successful that might have nothing to do with the space or very little to do with the space and how are you determining whether it's really the occupancy is succeeding regardless of where it's located and in which ways the space itself is actually feeding, supporting, and enabling the occupancy to, to reach whatever level of success it's there. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so, so just to repeat the question was... Um, and interested in the, the school spaces evaluation instrument and what are the metrics that we're using uh, to, to do those, those assessments. Um, just to reiterate too that um, there's three modules to that, one of which doesn't exist yet, um, but we identified should exist, and that's about design process. How do you know if you're engaged in a good design process and how would you evaluate that? So we're, we're working on that one. Um, but the two that do exist, uh, I think, think you're referring to the indoor environment quality one, which is much more an engineering focused thing, and that's why it's segregated from the others. Um, it's really about um, quantitative data and a little bit of quantitative, qualitative as well, but the alignment of pedagogy and space module, um, it's, it is reasonably complicated because, as I said, it's not one where we're taking an overarching view on what education should look like and what are the pedagogical models and, and how should, should learning be enacted in a school. So the first part of that, that process is to, um, to survey and interview uh, the, those people in school leadership positions and to get a really good understanding of what their desired education model is as the basis for evaluation. Um, and then uh, it's, it's, it's quite a long process in terms of it's got three phases. Um, so that's phase one. Phase two um, is a series of surveys which look at um, people's beliefs around how particular aspects of the learning process are supported by the space itself to do with things like social organisation. Does the space support the right numbers of people? Um, to do with 
the types of settings, which I think we've talked about quite a bit. Do you have the right sort of furniture to, to organise people in ways that you'd like? Um, to things like, um, you know, is the, is the technology that you desire allowing you to engage in the right activities that are in keeping with your model, et cetera, et cetera. And the last phase, which is really to sort of to dig deeper into the issues, um, is a focus group which feeds back the findings to then ask people to, you know, is this, is this how you see the alignments? What, what do we need to address more deeply? And so that's, that's kind of a, a brief overview. And, um, and three, three layers of people are interviewed, the, the leadership group, the occupants, but also the students as well. Which yeah, so there's a mul multiple can. stakeholders involved in that. Um, Claire and I recently did uh, we'll use our own tool um, to do an evaluation of a, a new modular building in Victoria, which was really informed around um, sustainable design and, and the desire to reduce energy consumption by 90 per cent. And our state education system or department said, oh, you know, these are our objectives. And we said, well, but is it a good space for teaching and learning? And they said, well, we don't know. So uh, we said, well, we'll use our tool and we'll, we'll, we'll find out, you know, in the context of that school where that particular building was being prototyped. Um, and, and largely in keeping with their model, the building was, was quite effective. But they did identify a number of limitations in terms of how they might develop their model into the future. And effectively it is an action research process where there's a, a, a walkthrough at the end where you perhaps feed back to the school and, and think about how the spaces might be better aligned with the um, educational vision for that particular school. And the other thing, um, Ben, that I, I don't think you mentioned is that the process is, is set up in a way that it can be devolved down, it doesn't need to have yeah. outside experts coming in, it can be done in-house and that's, that's certainly a good, what our that's a good point Catholic Education Department was keen to have. Yeah, and, and um, at our Learn uh, Partners meeting last week, uh, it was agreed that we would continue to um, try and create a, a much more user-friendly interface so that we're not the people who actually conduct the evaluations, people can do it within their own school context. Doug. So I've heard you talk about like environment and sustainability a few times and talking about design and cognizant of that. My sense in the US is we don't have that kind of integral relationship. We don't we don't think about sustainability in all we do. So I'm wondering if you can talk about any synergies between a concern with sustainability and a concern with uh, teaching and learning that would be persuasive for those that don't I can answer that or you can uh, answer that. You go first. Can I take it up first? <laughs> I'm just going to say, and I may get He's in got trouble. got the talking stick. <laughs> I may get in trouble for this, but you, you mentioned synergies around sustainability. Uh, I think there's conflicts as well. Uh, and that some of the sustainable design, uh, approaches to sustainable design are not always uh, attuned to pedagogical models. Um, and that, you know, particularly... Um, you know, some of the airflow issues that come with how do you move air through buildings uh, and how do you create spaces, I think this has stopped working, um, how do you create spaces for pedagogical, um, various pedagogical approaches, they don't always, they don't always match. But I'll let people talk about synergies. Well, it's nice about the conflicts too, so Yeah, <coughs> look, I, I think we um, are suffering from much the same problem. I mean, in this room we're representing two of the largest energy consumptive countries in the world. You know, Australia is right up there, believe it or not. And it's a massive problem. And it's something that it, we shouldn't even have to have this discussion. And it's what I say to schools when, when I brief them, we shouldn't even have to talk about sustainability because it should be just built in. Because it's immoral if you don't. And look, to give you, you know, some, some uh, turbocharged arguments, I think is very difficult. But um, it is coming into the education sector. We try to sell it as saying the building is the third teacher. You know, the building can actually be used as part of the um, learning model. You know, you can, you can do some building management system software on, you know, the energy in, energy out, use of water, etc., etc. So there's techniques, but it's, it's still a, you know, we shouldn't be having this discussion. But it's a good question. Um, 
then you alluded to the fact on the last slide that um, you'll be looking at museums starting mm -hmm. in 2014. So for the museum professionals in the room, uh, um, can you give us a preview of what you'll be doing? And uh, specifically, will you be exploring the um, connectedness between school learning environments and museum learning environments? We're, we're exploring that question, hopefully. I should say that that's a, a grant application. Uh, but we're very confident <laughs> that they're going to they're gonna give it to us. There's a lot of interest. Um, it's led by uh, a woman named Diane Mulcahy, who uh, is very well respected, and, and I'm writing her coattails on that one. But, um, but we're, we're, we're looking at exactly the question you raised about what, what's the relationship between museum uh, sided learning and, and, and what impact might that have on schools and I can't answer the question yet but you know hopefully in two years time we might have some good good responses so yeah we're I think we're we're investigating that that issue of affect um, and we hope to transfer some of the theory we can build to other contexts yeah so you have time for one more question and then I need to pitch our reception which I hope you come to an <laughs> another question Jay, what's an interactive reception? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Um, the reception is in the Wyatt Center atrium, possibly one of the most awkward spaces imaginable. Uh, it is where two buildings join one half floor off. Alternately, it's very beautiful because it preserves the exterior of a historically significant building, and that's very cool. Um, so uh, you can follow us to that space, but it is up at the head of the Peabody Quad. If you look for the building with the giant rotunda, that's the old side. If you sneak around the corner and go in underneath, you'll be in the atrium space. It's interactive exactly in the sense that you need to come. Uh, there will be wine and hors d'oeuvres and other things like that, so that makes it even more interactive. Um, and so I guess I do want to explain this a little bit. Doug. You underscore the importance of not going in through the front. If you come through the front, as you you will never get to the back. Well, if you, come, if you come in the front, you will be in the middle of another event. Uh, which they may have better stuff than us, but they, it's not nearly as interactive, so you should go around the side. Uh, you do need to go like out around the parking lot and then come in on the very bottom floor on the other side. So the interactive part of this is actually inspiring. Sorry? The interactive part is That's social interaction with someone in the room now. We're talking about once you're there, uh, which hopefully will be social as well. So uh, w when Kevin and I were in uh, Australia during our summer and their winter, we stayed in the Gertrude area. You did, yes, Fitzroy. Fitzroy. And they had a projected light festival, uh, much to our surprise, in which people, the, the, the buildings face each other, and they're older buildings across the street environment. And at night, they take very high energy, high lumens projectors, and they project images on the facing building and they rectify them to the architectural features of the building, and then they move. So stuff's happening in those images, and it's kind of shocking. A number of cities do this. Apparently Sydney does it in a big way as well, I've learned. So we were just like, wow, you know, that is so cool. We were thinking, could that possibly be used for educational purposes? And so we have a little exploration in projected light, interactive spaces that's Pretty weak by comparison, <laughs> uh, but it's like it's very lively. And Chris is sitting over here, so I know he's probably <laughs> laughing at us already. He hasn't, he hasn't even seen what we did. Uh, so come, come hang out with us in that space. And there's wine. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.